with Diane Altachewski. Let me introduce my first guest, Patrick Albano, with Aaron Galleries. Hi, how are you, Patrick? Uh, great, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you some questions about how you started to become into the Aaron Galleries. What have you been your first child experiencing with a pen and pencil? Uh, I remember uh, my uh, father uh, started a, a bowling center, and I guess I was, we're going back to probably early 1950s, and uh, he would have me, which at the time I didn't understand it, but he would have me keep score for the people that were bowling in the bowling center, and uh, which actually really helped me a great deal in math, because I had to, to uh, learn addition and subtraction. And uh, I would take the bowling sheets and I would actually r draw on the back of those sheets. Oh. So that was my first experience. And then I, I you know, I would go, <laughs> I would parade around my drawings to the the uh, the bowlers to get their reaction. Oh wow! So that's my first experience. Thank you. How did your parents encourage a passion for the arts? Uh, I, you know, I, I think that. You know, I really don't know how my passion for the arts came about, but it, it, it did actually, it, it's there. And uh, I don't know what side of my, I don't know, was my mother or my father, although my father, I will tell you, uh, studied to be a shop teacher. Mm -hmm. And he definitely had an art ability with his hands to do things. And he did some really interesting things with his hands. I think maybe that, maybe that was the inspiration, the Italian side, I'm not sure. Uh, my mother's Macedonian. I don't know, but uh, it's someplace in me. I have this very this passion for art. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I understand you had an education at the University of Iowa. Yes. What was your concentration in? Um, my concentration at Iowa. I got a I, I uh, got a Master of Arts degree in hospital administration, hospital and health administration. Uh, it was during the. Uh, Vietnam War days, and I, uh, my undergraduate school was uh, University of Mississippi, and I was an ROTC. I was uh, ROTC, and I was slated to become a pilot, and I, I didn't want to do that. I was kind of demotivated to be a pilot uh, during the Vietnam War days, and so uh, I, I had actually intended to go to law school at that time, and I was told that I couldn't. Uh, by the Air Force, they said, "If you know, you don't have that as a choice. Uh, we're going to send you to Vietnam." And I said, "Okay, well, what can I do?" And they said, "We need hospital administrators." So, uh, you know, I raised my hand and I went off to University of Iowa. How long were you in the University of Iowa? It was for? a two-year program with a thesis. Oh. Yeah. What was what was your work like afterward? Well, I actually worked in hospitals uh, in the Air Force, and then. The last two years, I worked for the Surgeon General uh, in hospital construction. This is like in the 70s, uh, towards the end of the Vietnam War. What made you flip into the arts? What was your first decision? I, well, I, you know, I had, when I finished my Air Force uh, uh, commitment, I uh, went back to Missouri. I'm from a little town in Missouri, uh, Crystal City. and went back there and was just kind of trying different things, trying to find what I had a passion for. And uh, I remember uh, I, uh, going to an art show in St. Louis and seeing Thomas Hart Benton uh, lithographs mostly, maybe a drawing or maybe a painting. And I was fascinated by that. And so I put an ad in an Iowa paper uh, for Thomas Hart Benton original prints, drawings, that sort of thing. I also put an ad in to buy art books, and I was just passionate about it. I, I didn't want to do anything else. So I didn't want, to, didn't want to work in the family business. I had a foundation company. I gave that away. Uh, I just, all I wanted to do was uh, do this art business, buy and sell art. Oh, how did you turn around that Benton into a future career? I just had, at that time, it's sort of funny. I had this one lady who was in Kansas City who wanted to buy these Benton lithographs, and I actually found one, and uh, I didn't pay much for it. And uh, I, I, had a, I had a little airplane because I had learned to fly airplanes in ROTC, and I remember flying over to her 
and selling her this Benton print. And I thought I died and went to heaven. Oh. You know, I got a check and it was like the greatest thing in the world. And then I think I realized that, you know, right out there in America, you know, I, uh, I appreciated what was there and you, you could find things and make a living uh, in art, the art business. What was your first um, gallery about? Um, at, at my, my first gallery was in, in uh, this little town where I grew up in, in Crystal City, actually Festus. It's a twin city, uh, Missouri. And I started there and then I moved to a gallery in St. Louis uh, for several years through the 80s. And then in 1989, I had a key employee who left me and I decided to move to Chicago. So we spent uh, over 20 years in the city of Chicago, first on Michigan Avenue, and then I was on Oak Street for 15 years. But what happened, why I moved to Glenview, I, um, in, in the late 90s, I went home one night and I was watching this BBC program on uh, Chinese orphanages, and it was called The Dying Rooms. And when I watched the program, I said to myself, I could take one of those girls. They were like, the, the, uh, the one child law in China was overflowing the, 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 the orphanages with girls. Mm -hmm. So I, I got this idea that I should adopt a, a daughter. And, um, and I did it. And, I, and when I had forgotten about it, then it happened. And so I had a, a, a baby Chinese girl that I went, I went to China and got her and brought her back. And I, fortunately, I have an incredible support system here. I was, I'm just a blessed man I, uh, of uh, people that are now her family, uh, Julia's family. And then I realized when she was 13, I was commuting into the city, coming back home. And, uh, and I realized I felt I needed to be here in Glenview close to her when oh. she hit 13. And uh, I moved my gallery to Glenview. And it was also a time too when, you know, the, the, we, the recession hit, things were difficult, people weren't buying things and coming into the gallery on Oak Street. So it was a good time for me to weather the storm of the uh, recession. So we, we opened up, we were uh, on, uh, in the Glen for uh, over four years. And then recently I moved to, uh, I bought a building on Waukegan across from Heinen's and moved there. So. Um, you know, I, uh, I really uh, encourage uh, people in Glenview and to bring their children or come and look at what we have. Um, I th you know, I, I really, uh, you know, don't care if they buy from us. I think it's an opportunity they should come and look. And I think it's good for them to bring their children. And so I'm, I, I'm always, I invite the uh, uh, people and families of Glenview to come and see what we have. How was his first days like back then? It was a matter of like uh, of finding things and then finding the client. And we're going back over 35 years ago. And uh, it, it was like, you, you know, I was learning uh, about the, everything I could about art. And, uh, you know, you, it's, uh, you know, you push back those envelopes of things that you don't know trying to find out what's this about and what, you know, what's this about. And there's also, there's sort of like a, and I've realized this now that I've been in it for a while, there's sort of a wave of what people are interested in and collecting. And I learned this from an old art dealer. It's usually like about 50 years. So if you want to know what's hot today, you go back 50 years ago. We're at, in 2014. So you go back to 1964. It was popping up in New York. We had left abstract expressionism. I know uh, a friend of mine, uh, well, he's now in, the, in his 90s, but he's an old abstract expressionist. And he said about 1962, he couldn't sell his paintings in New York. Wow. It had already changed. It was going to popping up. And so now what's happened in that field? Uh, you got Andy Warhol, who's probably one of the most well-known 20th century American artists. Mm -hmm. um, so, and who are the top artists in the 21st century for surreal or minimal art? Well, minimalism comes out of the 20th century, really. Um, and you have like, uh, 
there's a guy by the name of Ryman. I'm forgetting his first name, but Ryman, R-Y-M-A-N. He does these just totally minimal canvases of just white paint. Uh, and he is considered one of the major minimalists. Uh, who else do we have? I don't know if you want to call Rothko a minimalist, but certainly he just does these bands of color. Uh, they're certainly somewhat minimal. And then another one's Kelly. Um, Ellsworth Kelly does these, you know, just color bands. Um, and those are your major minimal people, but they're coming out of the 20th century, not the 21st century. Wow. Yeah. And they're still, you know, they're still known now but, and collected, but it's that same thing. When were they painting? In the 60s. In the so 60s. 50 years ago they were doing it, and now, they, now they're at the forefront. And who are the top clients in um, the Glenview community for air galleries? That's a good question. I, uh, I mean, we have some collectors here in Glenview, but I don't know that, you know, I don't know that, uh, maybe I'm still s trying to find those people that I think would want to develop a great art collection or that sort of thing. You find some people collecting, but not at a real high level. Uh, we do have clients. Uh, my, my, one of my neighbors bought a uh, Grant Wood print uh, from me. And Grant Wood, uh, you may know he, he did American Gothic. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're going back to into the 30s. American Gothic uh, was received by the Art Institute. It's probably the most well-known American painting. It said the farmer with the pitchfork. Oh, I remember. You know, that painting. And, um, it's, it's actually, uh, I saw a lecture because the University of Iowa does a symposium on Grant Wood. And um, um, anyway, there was a, Wanda Korn, who's an expert on wood, uh, spoke there and she said that the painting's down in its third generation. It was discovered in the early 30s and then it kind of receded into the, uh, uh, backwards into the 40s because we went into abstract expressionism. Nobody wanted that regionalism because uh, it's it's a representational painting of a farmer with a pitchfork. And then it comes back, I think, like in the uh, 60s or 50s or 60s. You know, you had uh, people like uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, Americans, you know, major Americans were actually uh, presenting themselves with the, the pitchfork. And so I had that second generation. And, and then now, uh, in the third uh, phase, it's being received worldwide. So you might have Vla uh, Vladimir P Putin with a pitchfork, you know, in the painting. So it, it has, it, she says, she talks about it has three lives. So these, these cycles occur in art, and that's uh, another cycle. Yeah. Oh. For uh, the new generation of young artists in contemporary fine arts, how does it like to make abstract or contemporary art versus f classical design? How do you inspire a new generation of artists to produce, for example? Well, you know, I think uh, uh, young artists, and, uh, and I remember uh, Phil Dessen, he was an old art dealer in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Uh, Artists that are studying art, you know, they're, you know, if they go to a museum or they're, t like if they're at the Art Institute or wherever they might be, they learn about all the things that have been done in the past from all the different artists over the generations. And they filter all that, and I think what they have to find is what their direction is. You know, they're always, sometimes they're looking over their shoulder, they're looking at a, you know, Jackson Pollock, or they're looking at a Thomas Hart Benton, or they're looking... Uh, a different masters, Picasso, whatever it might be, to find out who they are. All these different art movements uh, uh, in, in, um, influence them. And now you have this movement now to cerebral art, which is hard for me to understand because I find it sometimes difficult to sell, but there's some great things there. And then they bring in all these different ideas and then and develop their own art. What they have to do is they have to do what they like and what they feel good about. Well, one of the most famous artists right now in Chicago area is a guy by the name of Theaster Gates. And he uh, is pretty amazing. He, 
He's involved in taking uh, on projects in the city of Chicago, mostly on the south side. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, like he, he bought a bank from the city for a dollar, and he's changing that bank into a cent art center. And then he also bought a house in one of the neighborhoods on the south side and converted it into a theater for a community. So now that community has a house where they go and oh. the kids are able to do art and also to, um, you know, do plays, which is wonderful. Think about that. I could be in a play. I don't think I need to go shoot somebody today. Uh, for parents that don't have like a wide range of budget, how is it important to have a community art center or have early childhood education in art for their I children? I think it's totally important. I think uh, it's, it's uh you know, children need to be exposed to the arts, and as I go back, I mentioned this earlier, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's important for America because they develop their minds, their creativity, and that's the only way we're going to stay ahead. You, you know, you, we, we are, America is inventive, and the reason we are is we use these cerebral centers of, in, uh, of invention that, you know, create Apple phones or whatever. Yeah. So. And for kids that want to become computer engineers and scientists, how do you incorporate um, bracing their creativity or intellectual mind through art? Exposure, exposure, I think. Exposure. Yeah, I think exposure, maybe taking an art class, uh, just, just walking to the Art Institute, whether it be look, you know, just develop your visual sense, you know, right. Uh, uh, a classic um, artist like George O'Keefe really emphasized American art history. Or is it more of a new age movement? No, I think, well, O'Keeffe is uh, very much accepted uh, on her own account. And uh, I think that uh, she's part of American art history. And she does definitely get attention, uh, you know, more and more. I think, you know, maybe more so than earlier, like let's say if we go back into the 40s, um, she now, you know, is at the forefront of that sequence group uh, as an artist. And, uh, and even I understand her more and more. A lot of people think that she does abstracts. She really doesn't. She paints what she sees. It's just that what she sees turns into a, a kind of an abstracted form. And who are the top um, sellers you represent, the top artists? Well, we, we, uh, we, have a, we, we do a lot of American master prints which are, you know, Thomas Hart Benton, uh, Grant Wood, who I mentioned earlier, and, um, you know, George Bellows, and then on and on. You know, we recently we've been buying some of the abstract expressionists, so we have Robert Motherwell. Um, we also, uh, we always like to try to have a Warhol. I don't have one now, but, uh, you know, what, what you would see if you went to a, a, a museum like the Art Institute, and uh, we're pretty broad. I just uh, recently got from one of my old clients, these things are generational. They're now going into a nursing home. So they gave me a lot of things they were buying from me in the early 90s. And so I'm reselling them for them. One of the things they gave me was a Durer, which we have now. And it's, uh, it was made about 1502. So the, the piece is over uh, 500 years old. In fact, today I'm going down the Art Institute to compare this Durer to the one that's in the Art Institute's collection. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're pretty broad in what we have. And how many receptions do you have in your gallery, for example, a month? Well, we, we don't do many receptions. We don't do many shows. We occasionally do shows in the gallery. We do these shows on the road. We just recently had an opening uh, for my new gallery. I'm now on Waukegan. And, uh, we 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 have done we did it we did a show actually for a grade school uh, not too long ago and I think that and the and the, the teacher's been back now twice, but he brings his students to the gallery and they display their art and the families come, and uh, I think it's just great it's wonderful, and they also they they brought musicians to play music while people viewed the art and I. When I looked at this art, I was just, myself, I was totally impressed. These were 13-year-old children, and their art was incredible. It was wonderful. Oh. So uh, it was just, I think, uh, I think the future is really good for young artists. And, uh, and I go back to Phil Dessen saying that the greatest artists are alive today. 
they, they have all the history of the arts, you know, filtered into them and then they're developing their new thing. Do you ever cooperate with um, early education centers or Evanston or Glenview um, High School to um, well, work? One of the things I've done, I've been on some committees uh, with the Southside Community Arts Center, which is uh, it's on the South Side, and they had a program where they were edu they were actually paying kids to come and do art uh, classes. Mm -hmm. They were teaching young kids to c come and take art classes, or they were paying them a dollar an hour. And I think that's a great, it was a great thing because if you give a kid a paintbrush or a, uh, a trumpet or, or whatever or encourage them to be an actor, they're going to drop the gun. They're not going to shoot anybody. They're not going to want to do drugs. They're going to want to do those things, the arts. Wow. Uh, and that involvement is, is what we need to do to save our, our cities. And I think people realize that, corporations realize that, and that's where we need to go. Um, How far is your family now extending for, I know the Rand Corporation was interested in the Evan Arts Groups um, getting their children out to your um, center. How far extended are you in the Glenview community? Well, I mean, I, I, uh, I don't really have any programs per se with uh, the the Glenview com community other than I have an open door and a business here and we're, we're open mm -hmm. uh, to everyone. Um, I do know of a program uh, in Evanston where it's the, uh, uh, I think it's EA, Evanston Artist for Youth. It's a, it's a, uh, a nonprofit that reaches out to 5,000 kids mm -hmm. to teach them how, you know, teach them art and uh, they, they actually have a fundraising program over there. I wish we had one here. Uh, it's gonna have to be, you know, the, the arts community of Glenview is gonna have to get involved and do that. We have artists here. We have some really great artists in, in Glenview. Yes. And so, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, people have to get together and see this as an opportunity and, and a necessity to get kids involved in the arts. It, what it, do you recommend having artists have an internship or an externship in an art gallery? How do you recommend them getting the first, I guess, opening into an art gallery or? Well, I, I don't know. I have a, I have an intern right now from the Art Institute, and I'm I'm really blessed to have her because she was with me last summer, and now she's back this summer doing an internship. But she just has a passion for art. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I like to see. She loves it, and she loves being in my gallery. She loves learning. Uh, she loves doing all the things, and, and she's really a great painter. She, she won the uh, Best Artist of the Year at New Trier when she was in high school oh. and got a scholarship at the Art Institute. And she's passionate, and she's developing. Um, I like her art, so we're actually in the process of buying some of her things for our gallery, to have her at our gallery. And then... We do do some shows around the country. We'll do a show in New York in the fall and one at, at Art Basel in Miami. And so we, uh, we'll be showing her things there. Wow. And see how the, how the, the, the people react. Um, that's essentially she does something and she likes it or if I like it, I, I like what she's doing. And then so we're going to show it. You know. And I was just wondering, um, for young children, how do you develop um, skills in the talents and art? What do you recommend for young children to have in their education or their hobbies? Well, it, it, at least I would like young children to look, to learn to look at art, to look at the visual things in, in life. And that, that comes from, you know, a, lot of, a lot of times that comes from the parents and the teachers. And uh, there's some programs for young people, um, you know, and I, I really think it's super important that children be involved in the arts and it's it's kind of a uh, a sore subject in that there's so much of an emphasis on math and science that for example like at Glenbrook South the, there's a requirement that the children take three hours which is one course in four years of an arts class whether it be music or drama or um, art and um, a lot of kids don't even want to do that. They just are being pushed, you know, to into the sciences so hard that they can't work that in. But uh, everything I read, and I uh, mentioned this 
to you the you know the RAND uh, uh, there, there's a RAND I think it's a board a RAND uh, institution in New York did a study of the importance of art for children and uh, most of the the uh, scholars and the and even in the people that advance in the sciences have had math, I mean have had art in their background mm -hmm. and I encourage people to look you know their children to, to look and get involved in the arts whether it be music or uh, drama or you know whatever it might be. How much do you recommend the Art Institute for young artists or do you have s your Well I think, I think that you know it, it's like, uh, you know, do you go to Harvard or do you go to Illinois State? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. I think it's up to the individual and there's, you know, you know, no matter where you are, you could, you could be a great artist, uh, not even have a college education. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, uh, so I, I, I think that uh, what I would recommend to somebody is to pursue your passion. You know, maybe you're, maybe you're gifted as a sculptor, do that. Um, maybe you're a designer and do that. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do with it. So. And what do you see the future of Aaron Galleries about? Aaron so Galleries uh, future? Uh, we're we're uh, growing and I think I'm on this uh, you know evolution of trying to be open and like I said uh, in a wave and we, we keep we're changing slowly because like what we carried say uh, 20 years ago is not what we are now we still bring up the past but I see also the there's a changing aesthetic and maybe that's part of this wave that I'm talking about younger people younger generations are less interested in what their parents liked whether it be 19th century or American Impressionism, and they're more interested in abstract art and color. And so we, we kind of go with that, and it kind of like, uh, it's, it just sort of like changes the, the look of our gallery. So when you come to my gallery, I'm sure it looks, if you went to my gallery uh, 20, 30 years ago, you'd see a lot more representational paintings, meaning things that look like, when you look at, oh, that's a tree, now you come and see an abstract with color. Yeah, it's changing. And I, where are we going? I don't know. I mean, there's a like I uh, uh, I mentioned that there's a lot more cerebral art, and there's some great artists that do that. Thank you for today's visit, for Patrick O'Brien with Aaron's Galleries. My pleasure. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. I uh, I look forward to our community getting involved in the arts. Well, thank you. Thank you for visiting with Real People, Real Matters with Diana Zaczynski.